Hello everyone and welcome to another book review video, this time on Peak Secrets from the New Science of Expertise by Anders Ericsson and Robert Poole. This book is another one that's been recommended to me by a sports psychologist I've talked to, as well as being a mainstay on the bookshelves of some of my psych professors at my university. So first we're going to talk about some key themes. And the key themes in this book are that top performers, what separates them is that they practice more and they practice better, and we're going to get into that pretty soon. The idea of mental representations and deliberate practice, and that talent is not the key to peak performance. So the first topic we're going to cover is adaptability, and this is what practice does. It's what practice really is for. When we talk about adaptability, what we're really referring to here is brain elasticity. And this is the idea that even when we're adults, our neurocircuitry is not completely still. We still have the opportunity to, in a sense, rewire our brains. And the interesting example that the authors use in this book is the brains of London taxi drivers. Now, the posterior of the hippocampi in London taxi drivers is much larger than in any other population. And this part of the brain deals with navigation. And it's so because London taxi drivers have to go through a bunch of training and know basically how to get from any point A to any point B in the city. And thus, the brain adapted to meet this need. This is why they have the larger posterior hippocampi. What brain elasticity allows us to do is that it allows us to hone what Erickson calls mental representations. And this is very similar to the idea of a schema. Basically, the general idea of something that we hold in our heads. For example, we all have a mental representation of what a dog is. Without this, we'd have to produce lots of mental effort just to understand a sentence about a dog. Mental representations allow us to get around the limits of our short-term memory by providing us rules, relationships, and concepts we can easily access from long-term memory. This manifests itself in elite performers' pattern recognition. A chess master can play blindfolded because they have such well-developed mental representations that they can quote-unquote see the board in their mind and recognize the possible moves. So what the big aim of practice is should be to enhance our mental representations. So if we believe what separates the best is their quality of mental representations, and that these representations are developed through practice by rewiring the brain, then we next need to examine how we all practice. First, we'll look at the usual ways of practice that, as we'll see, aren't as effective as they could be. The basic usual type of practice that most people partake in is what can be considered naive practice. When we're first learning a new skill, we might take a few lessons, play in some scrimmages, and just try to reach a basic level of competence. For example, I personally am at a basic level of competence that I can make pasta with red sauce. Then we usually settle in there and just get comfortable, not trying to make any unique dishes or anything like that. When we go to practice, we're just going through the motions again. There is no goal in mind. Thus, even if we have glaring weaknesses, we aren't actually doing anything to address them. This idea ties into the idea of maintenance practice and the common assumption about experience. We assume that if we keep doing something over and over, it will make us better. For example, we believe that a doctor who's been practicing for 20 years is more equipped than a doctor right out of medical school or that someone who has been driving for 20 years is more skilled than a one-year driver. However, research shows that this is not necessarily true. Without a specific kind of practice, experience will not grow skill. If anything, skill may drop off as the years go by and the person gets comfortable and is never challenged. This leads us to consider a better type of practice. So now we take a look at a better form of practice. This will form the backbone of the gold standard of practice that we'll get to later. Purposeful practice is defined by a few concepts that make it unique. One, there are specific goals involved. Instead of just going out to work on my jump shot for 30 minutes, purposeful practice would be, I want to hit 10 shots in a row from this spot on the court. This leads into another component, feedback. If what you're doing is not measurable, you can't get feedback on if you're actually getting better. If you're practicing a speech but don't keep track of your mistakes, 
you have no way of knowing if you're actually improving. The next idea is that purposeful practice involves getting outside of your comfort zone. Practice should be hard. It is why people trying to build muscle attempt to lift weight that is just outside of their current capabilities. Without reaching outside what you can currently do, your brain has no reason to adapt and get to that level. Finally, the component that brings purposeful practice together is focus. It is impossible to indulge in purposeful practice that is on the edge of your capabilities without giving the task your full attention. Now, all that with purposeful practice sounds pretty good, but there's one key component missing, and that is why deliberate practice truly stands out. With purposeful practice, we can push ourselves and attempt to get better, but we don't really know where we are going and how to get there. Deliberate practice separates itself because it is informed. As we will see, this makes a huge difference. Let's take a closer look at deliberate practice. Deliberate practice contains all the tenets of purposeful practice, specific goals, feedback, being outside one's comfort zone, and being focused. But it also adds two unique tenets. Deliberate practice is focused towards an objective standard of excellence and is led and informed by a teacher who is an expert at getting people to that standard. This is important because it provides direction and specific skill development that is proven to get to a certain objective place. Here, the mountain metaphor works. Purposeful practice is like taking roots of a mountain by yourself without knowing exactly where you're going and without help from an expert. It will get you up, but maybe not to the top, nor in the fastest time. Deliberate practice is like being led by a Sherpa who knows the way and knows what must be done. You're on the right route going exactly to the top. So how do we actually perform deliberate practice? Well, Erickson makes it clear that it's easier in some fields than others. For example, there really isn't an objective measure of what makes an excellent gardener, but we do have objective measures for chess. Fields that have histories of developed teaching methods and objective standards are easier to perform deliberate practice in. However, if what you want to improve upon is less developed in this way, you can still apply the principles of deliberate practice as best you can. If you can find a teacher, that's great. If not, examine the experts or the people that are better than you and try to tease out the specific skills that make them better. The emphasis should always be on the skill, on doing versus just knowing. Now, along the way of improvement, there are some obstacles to face. One is plateauing or getting stuck. This may come when we feel we are at the edge of our abilities. There's nothing we can do to get better. However, we usually can find something to improve if we just push ourselves a little harder than usual. For example, playing against an opponent who is better than those you usually play against can expose weaknesses you had not seen before. And getting past these weaknesses is often best done by trying something different, not necessarily trying harder. This allows for creativity in how you approach problems. Another obstacle is maintaining motivation, as deliberate practice is a hard thing, and it will take years and years to reach peak performance. Erickson conceptualizes maintaining motivation simply. Strengthen the reasons to keep going or weaken the reasons to quit. Weakening the reasons to quit involve maintaining physical and mental health to avoid burnout and optimizing your environment and schedule so that deliberate practice becomes part of your routine. Strengthening the reasons to keep going involves creating a sense of identity and mastery with your skill and cultivating belief that you can achieve your big goals. So far, this book has argued that the best are the best because of the way they practice. Now, the authors will address a common counter-argument, the advantages of innate talent. Now, the prodigy would seem to be an example of natural talent being at the forefront of peak performance. However, Erickson claims that he has not found a single instance of true prodigy that relied on talent and not deliberate practice. Even Mozart, considered the prototypical prodigy, had actually been engaged in deliberate practice from an early age, as his father was a music teacher who pushed the young boy in the early parts of his life. Really, Erickson claims, the only genetic or natural advantage people have is their physical build, and only in some instances. For example, being tall would make it easier to become a great basketball player compared to being short. Even IQ, as predictive as it is, is not a significant divisor between the best and the rest. In some fields even, like chess, 
the top players often tend to have lower IQ scores than the players a rung below. This may be because they learned how to practice better when they were younger, when the high IQ players could afford to coast. Erickson warns that believing in natural talent can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. We believe we aren't naturally built for math, so we never put in the work to get good at it. This, for Erickson, is a tragic misstep that casts away human potential. Okay, time to wrap up this book. In conclusion, deliberate practice is the key to peak performance. The more we practice in this way, the better our mental representations will be, allowing us to reach our best performance. In this way, human potential can be seen like rungs on a ladder. Each step we take of improvement unlocks another possible level for us to climb to. Thus, if your goal is to be the best you can be, apply deliberate practice as best you can. So Erickson points forward at the next places he hopes the science will go. He wants to learn more about the mental representations of elite athletes and proposes studies where athletes would verbalize what they are thinking about during certain moments in competition. He also wants to apply deliberate practice in educational settings to improve learning and development of skills, not just knowledge. Here are some of my thoughts on this book. First, although it may seem like deliberate practice is antithetical to the more relaxed approach in The Inner Game of Tennis, which is the book I reviewed last week, I think there are some good similarities. Particularly, the emphasis on feedback and focus during practice sessions, whether that be feeling your swing and watching the outcome, or being completely focused on the task at hand, is a common theme among both books. Mental representations, I think, would be a good description of the way self too in the inner game of tennis is able to do all that it can do. Thus, combining the books, intense practice creates mental representations that allow us to perform on game day if we can get out of our egotistical self one analytical mind. Finally, I love how this book showed that practice isn't just going through the motions. Real improvement does not come from mere repetition, but from intense concentration with a goal in mind. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you again tomorrow in the next video.